Welcome to the Weekly Mag. We dedicate this week's episode to landscapes. We interview to acknowledge professional photographers of troubles and nature, Tino Soriano and Marta Brato. What a beautiful day for visiting a very special band of our musical landscape, the Balkan Paradise Orchestra, and prepare for a guess what about animals with our contestants Patricia Scalona and Mario Serra, and our will quizmaster Sergi Cervera. All this and more on the Weekly Mac, your favorite talk show in English, presented by Marcella Topor. Hello, since today we dedicate our show to landscapes, we have invited two photographers who collaborate with renowned publications and whose expert eyes have taken breathtaking images from around the world. But before we meet them, let's have a look at our glossary for the interview. Tino Soriano is a photographer, but he likes to think of himself as a storyteller. So, he is the person who tells a story or gives an account of something. In this case, he tells stories by means of his photographs. One of the scenes Marta Brato has taken astonishing pictures of are the Northern Lights. This is the usual way to refer to the Aurora Borealis of the Northern Hemisphere. Both Tino Soriano and Marta Brato use different lenses for their photographs. One of them is a wide-angle lens, which has a wider angle of view. Therefore, it allows capturing more of a scene within the photo than a normal lens. It's one of the three basic photographic lens types classified by relative focal length, the other two being a normal lens and a long focus lens. The long lens is used to take clear photographs of things that are a long way away, so the distant objects appear magnified. The most common type of a long focus lens is a telephoto lens. Tino Soriano is a well-known and awarded Catalan photojournalist and travel photographer who collaborates with many different magazines and organizations such as National Geographic or Lonely Planet. And Marta Bretto is an awarded nature photographer who is also a mountain guide specialized in astrophotography. And she spends days alone in the wild to take astonishing pictures. Well, Marta and Tino, welcome and thank you for coming. You're welcome too. You're well, welcome. Thank in you. the first place, you know, uh, you focus more on social aspects, uh, while Marta is more interested in wild nature. Mm? <laughs> okay, so tell me about it. Okay, ladies first. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> uh, then, yes, I'm very in interested in nature, and inside of nature, I like the wildest part of it. So, w w which I like the most, it's getting lost uh, for. Many days, uh, I carry my backpack with everything I need for uh, the trek and to find situations, to find myself uh, reflected in the eyes of uh, wildlife, for example, to find different lights, to see how these lights uh, change the landscape. So it's like not very prepared, you know, it's like uh, Improvised. just finding uh, whatever is going to happen. Okay. Well, Tino, tell me about uh, social photography. Well, uh, more than a photographer, I think that I am a storyteller. What you really like is experience. And to, to hold a camera, it's a mess, the best way to be introduced and to be allowed to be the, the speaker, the, the, the people who explain the story. Is uh, in some way, I'm an experience collector. And what does it mean for you to have published photographs in such prestigious publications such as National Geographic or Lonely Planet? Well, it's a, it's a dream. I think that any photographer in the world has uh, goals to go to National Geographic or to or Magnum. <laughs> as a photographer, as, uh, as fortunately, uh, I started working with National Geographic uh, 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, it's more than a dream. It's like uh, Christ come from the heaven and, <laughs> and, and, and bless you. <laughs> but it's, it's not easy because otherwise they are also very, very strict, strict mm -hmm. about uh, the results. It's not, but uh, on the other side, they uh, led you uh, to work in, uh, in, in the way you want, the way you see, okay. the way you react to the reality, the way, the way you explain the story. Mm, I see. And uh, Marta, tell me how, how about your career. How did you um, start in photography? Yeah, well, in, in fact, it's, it was very strange because I start with nature, not with photography. And then uh, when you are in nature and you find yourself, 
It's like uh, you're doing what you like. Uh, I like to explore. I like to walk. I, I was very good at winter sports also. Mm. Uh, then I studied uh, to be a mountain guide just because I loved mountain. And one day, just I don't know how, uh, a camera came to me <laughs> uh, inside of a trip, uh, a trip to French Alps. And I was like with this camera from a friend of mine. It wasn't my camera either. So I was like photographing all the trip. And I realized, okay, this has something really good. So as the days, uh, the, the years go by, I started to realize that I could uh, fix together uh, nature, mountain and photography. Well, you've uh, guided uh, photographic expeditions uh, to Iceland, Scotland and even Mount uh, Kenya. So uh, what is your favorite landscape of all? Yeah, good. That's a question everybody asks me. Yeah, and for it's me, not it's very original, very, no? It's but it's, well, <laughs> no, but I think there's not a correct answer because every place... Well, it, it depends it, on the weather. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, it's very easy to see that I, I guide five uh, photography tours per year to Iceland and even when I have free time, I go to Iceland again. So maybe this means something, but I really cannot say that Iceland is better, for example, to Scotland, because I also love Scotland and I found very nice things there, uh, amazing wildlife, amazing landscapes. Mm -hmm. In fact, Iceland and Scotland has has a lot of things in common, but a lot of things different. So I, see. Okay. I like to see these uh -huh. different things everywhere. Mm -hmm. Tina, in your case, do you have a special place in the world uh, that you like, uh, maybe more than others, or you agree with uh, Marta that each place is different and it's got its own charm? Oh, no, 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 no. To me, it's, uh, it's very clear. Banyolas Lake, the place where I live, <laughs> yes, is. I decided to live in the place I love, the, the place I feel easy, the place I understand uh, about everything, and also the place I control every day, every morning, or even in the evening, I go with my camera when I'm home, going around the lake to discover anything that uh, yesterday I didn't see. The idea to me, Banyolas Lake is a place where to, 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 to play, to, to learn to practice uh, photography and the same photograph that I can take in Banyoles Lake. I can uh, use the methodology in uh, Titicaca Lake or any other lake. But, okay, uh, also I like Italy. Italy is a place, it's a wonderful place for photographers. Uh, I, I feel like many Spaniards very, very easy when I'm in, in Italy, maybe. I prefer Italy in the sense that they are more crazy than us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as a photographer, I love China. China, it, it's a place full of ethnics, full of, uh, well, it's, it's not a country, it's a continent. But the idea is that uh, it's a new continent to discover. We've got your books here. Let's start uh, with Marta's. It's called Sideral. And uh, it's full of, um, it's full of uh, skies with, uh, and stars. Uh, tell us about the Northern Lights. There are lots of Northern Lights here. Where did you take them? Actually, you can take the Northern Lights anywhere uh, near the pole, then the North, um, the North Pole. Uh, in fact, there are uh, polar aurora. You can find the, the Northern ones in the North Pole, and then you have the uh, aurora australis, I think maybe in English, okay. uh, next to the South Pole. But it's easier to go to the North, no? Yes. It's <laughs> then uh, I think in my book, there are aurora from Sweden from Sarex National Park. It's the wildest area in Europe. And maybe there's something about Iceland also. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the longest time you had to wait uh, for uh, good pictures like that? The longest time I have been walking uh, through a wild area to take pictures, it's been 15 days, which is the the, the food I can carry on my back. I see. <laughs> For more plus days, I maybe have to grow better muscles. <laughs> I see. You look okay. <laughs> well, Tino, uh, we also have uh, one of your books here. Uh, this is called Los Secretos de la Fotografía de Viajes. Yes. It's, it's full of uh, colorful photos, beautiful uh, photos from um, around the world. Thank you. Amazing. 
uh, really a great uh, book. Um, how many um, how many countries have you visited for this book? It's More a very, or less. It's a very good question because I, I, I never count how many countries have been visiting. Uh, as, as a traveler, a professional traveler, sometimes you go two, three, four, five times to the same country. Okay. I it's see. more about the experience than that about uh, the, the number of countries, but uh, let's say all the continents. Mm -hmm. You've just published a new book yes. called Are You the My Amirat in English? Uh, Help Me Look. Yes. So tell us about it. Is it like a sort of a guide to photojournalism? Uh, well, uh, in some way, uh, it's a Bible of photography. I've been, a Bible? A wow. Bible, yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm humble, very humble. I've been 25 years writing the, this book. Wow. Yeah, during 25 years, uh, writing about the most interesting questions that everybody used to ask me, and about the things that can, uh, in some way, help or insp inspire okay. to the people, uh, all the questions that people uh, had uh, in, in these three decades have the answer in this book. So I'm, I'm very proud of, of uh, it's like in some ways my legate. Oh, is, your legacy. Uh, so yes, uh, legacy. if we want to learn how to take uh, good photographs, uh, what should we do and what should we avoid doing? My best tip to take a good photograph is take less photographs. First to see and then to take the picture, not the opposite. Not okay. first take the picture not and the after the see. Yes. And Marta? I, I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with you. <laughs> because sometimes uh, I think we have not only to photograph, but also to see, to look and to, to understand. Enjoy. Yeah, to enjoy the moment. To enjoy. Uh, I was this uh, February photographing the Northern Lights with a group of travelers. Yes. And there was a moment that I had to say, please, everybody, stop, stop. making <laughs> pictures and just look at the sky. Stop because taking, it, that's stop a, taking that's pictures. That's a memory for you, not for everybody sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. the, the best pictures, uh, just keep in your in your mind. Uh, but anyway, to, to make a good photo, uh, there's a lot of tips, but I think it's good that to, to see, to look, to understand what you are seeing and think, how you want to, to tell this story. If we were a sailor, that we throw the net, and then we, we count how many different fish are in the, into the net, no? And it's not, uh, what it's important is to know about the fish you want, not about to fish, mm, it's about to know. I see, that's a great metaphor. That's okay. a difference. Well, we are amazed by the pictures of nature and travels by Tino Soriano and Marta Bretto. And now, when we take a glance at a landscape, we see many different geographical features. And of course, there's a word for every single one of them. And Helen Armstrong from International House Barcelona will teach you a few in today's first language tip. Don't miss it. Hi. When we talk about landscapes, we talk about mountains, valleys, and rivers. But there are different types of these, so today we're gonna to have a look at some examples. So mountains, we have mountain ranges, which are the groups or the line of mountains. For example, the Andes or the Pyrenees. On the side of mountains, we have slopes, which rise or descend on the side. And mesas, which are flat top mountains. Some of these can be found in the west of America, and they have cliffs on the side, which are very steep, and they usually go into the sea. For example, the White Cliffs of Dover. Now for rivers, the small river is called a stream, and these normally flow into other bigger rivers. And also we have ponds, which can be natural or artificial, and they're very small parts of water. For example, you could have one in your back garden. I used to have one in England with lots of frogs and fish in it. So for valleys, we have gorges, which are very narrow valleys, quite steep, and there's a stream running through it. And a big gorge is a canyon. Have you heard of the Grand Canyon in America? So these are very, very deep gorges with a river running through it. Okay, bye. Everything's okay when you know what's coming, but how will our guests react to Mark Broderick's mystery question? Stay tuned. 
few decades back, nature or travel photography was limited to professionals and amateurs who could afford the equipment. But nowadays, with smartphones and digital photography, absolutely everyone can give it a go. So let's talk about the social consequences of this with our new collaborator, Mireya Giro. Welcome to the Weekly Mag. Thank you, Marcela. It's nice meeting you. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> So, okay, so Mirai, what have you brought to us today? Well, there's a, lately a, a craziness of taking pictures of absolutely everything with our mobile phones. And I'd like to put some sense to it because now that everybody carries a camera and takes pictures of uh, at any time of everything, what is uh, being a photographer actually about? Well, being a photographer is someone that tried to make anything different from the other people. That's a point, and this is more close to philosophy mm -hmm. than photography. And you, Marta? <laughs> yes, I think today it's, it's like a kind of sickness, no? everybody wants to show what they have eaten, where they are going. I, I think it's very different. It's, I don't think that's photography. It's just uh, telling your life to other people. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different. Showing off. You know, what... Yeah. <laughs> In some way, photography, it's and it has been a new universal language. Mm -hmm. So people use photography as a grammar, just to explain how wonderful is the world, how wonderful is your life, how wonderful are you. Life is more interesting than the picture you show. Yeah. <laughs> Usually after and, uh, one month uh, traveling around, mm -hmm. you go back and people ask, what about your trip? And you say, well, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Look at the pictures, but it's nothing. There's uh, many pictures together, maybe it's a minute of, mm. of your life after a month. Some of my friends that are not photographers and, and they, they love showing their pictures of their journeys. And it's a nightmare sometimes. No? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. No, it's... <laughs> Do they, what about? It, it seems that they think that uh, I won't believe that they travel if they don't yeah. have a picture of every single place they've and visited. And selfies. And, and selfies, selfies also, But no? it's horrible because when yeah. you are taking a selfies, what's really important is in your back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's really, it's a pity. Mm. Well, actually, there have been all these cases of people actually losing their lives while taking a selfie. Uh, okay, like uh, this girl, she was driving with uh, with another girl, and she uh, taking a selfie was the last thing she did in her life because she they had an accident and and yeah. and they died, no? Or another guy who went uh, mm -hmm. to the mountains and uh, he he died because he was taking a selfie on the edge of a cliff and so on, no? Yeah. So more um, than a hundred people die <laughs> per year, especially Indian for selfies. You mean yeah, doing that? Really? Yes, 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 yes. And, this is incredible. Uh, and the amount is growing. Such a waste of the yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. But so, I, I think it's not a problem about the selfie itself. No. It's about... About the people. Uh, yeah, it's about <laughs> a, something about the brain. You know, you have to know what, what is the risk. Talking about the, the same issue, um, once a friend of mine uh, sent me a picture of a uh, sunset in Cambodia. And it was a gorgeous uh, picture. I, I thought she was in, alone in paradise. But then, uh, she's a very funny person. <laughs> she took a, uh, she sent me a, another picture of what was in front of the, yes. of the sunset. Mm -hmm. And the place was packed with uh, at least one million people <laughs> taking, taking the same, the same picture. picture. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that nobody actually was enjoying the real experience of, of, yeah. of that sunset, as you said before. Sunset point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sunset point. Take the picture from here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and every in Taj Mahal, in yeah. India, in Taj Mahal, it's yeah. very typical. There, the, you, yeah, you must go picture. two hours before the sunset, <laughs> because otherwise you don't have the place to photograph yeah. your Taj Mahal is. But why, even if it's cloudy, <laughs> yeah. it's cloudy. Yeah, exactly. you see people yeah, exactly. waiting for the sunset. Waiting for <laughs> <laughs> or in Finisterra as well, it happens. Yeah. 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 That, there was no sunset. <laughs> that, that happens to me a lot uh, with the photography trips. Yes. Uh, there's people coming with me because they want, for example, to Iceland, they want to shot that uh, waterfall, that mountain, that place, and they have the the perfect uh, photo idea in their brains. They have seen, they have Googled it, uh, they have seen lots of uh, photos winning contests and we go there and maybe it's cloudy and maybe mm. it's foggy and you don't see the mountains or mm. maybe it's crowded uh, in, yeah, the, yeah. in that place. 
And I always try to say them, you don't come here to make the same photo you have seen thousands of times on, on the internet. You come here to make your own point of view. Yes. And, and, and at last it's exactly. the best photo, it's the one you... And why do people do that? Uh, yeah. Uh, to, to so, take so, pictures uh, of the, the because same they, things? I and... think maybe they see those magnificent landscapes and they have been dreaming about that, that place. They want to go there and make that photo. But what happens to me when I go to a new place and I see that photo mm -hmm. that has even inspired me. I arrive there and I say, okay, I see it. I am not going to make this photo, I'm going to find another one. Mm -hmm. Because I don't feel happy to make the, the same photo as everyone. Mm -hmm. Mireia, which are the most uh, photographed places in Catalonia? There is a ranking, I think. Yeah, there's a ranking. Well, you know that Instagram is, is the second uh, social network, network more, most influential. I think you, you manage with that. We both, yeah. yes, we both have an Instagram. <laughs> so uh, I've done a research and I found that after Paris and, Lond and London, Barcelona is the most photographed city, European city. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, on the Instagram. And here's the top three most tagged Catalan sites. Can you guess which ones yes, might yeah. be yeah. In, in Barcelona? Let's see. The, the, yes, 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 yes. Which ones? Which ones? You know that? Sagrada Familia. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sagrada Familia. Is it? Okay. Because Ga Gaudí. Uh, had a special sense of light, uh, more, more advanced than any other photographer or any other people uh, a century later. Mm -hmm. So when you are inside Sagrada Familia, it's like being in, 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 the, in, the, in heaven. Mm -hmm. So incredible. here I have the, the numbers. <laughs> so the number one is... Uh, Sagrada Familia, Sagrada. Uh, 1,600,000 mentions in 2018 on Instagram. Yes. That's a lot. Yeah, that's the, the most stacked uh, site in Barcelona. Yeah. Camp and Nou and... And Montserrat the third one. Montserrat the third one. Are you, are you surprised? <laughs> Not really. It's, uh, yeah, well, it, it's a topic. The problem of yeah. um, photography is people take pictures of the topic and topic and the topic and the mm. topic again. Mm -hmm. It's not about the... Mm, uh, to me, it's, sometimes it's, it, it's a pity, you see, everybody taking the same picture, yeah. as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more interesting to, to be original, to, to try to be original for your brain, for your mind and for your photography. Mm -hmm. Every yeah. match you, you, you see, 100,000 people with over the cell taking pictures yeah, yeah. <laughs> of, of, of the field from uh, 200 meters away. <laughs> and this is messy, this is messy. Okay, yeah. so I have one question. If you, had, messy. if you had to take, if you had to take a picture of uh, one of these three places that Mireia has just mentioned, um, how would you do it? I mean, if you really had to, uh, yeah. which would be your angle? So the way to make uh, a new, uh, I okay. don't know, like a new way of photographing Montserrat or, yeah. or Sagrada Familia. Well, which first of all, I would angle. choose Montserrat because it's nature and for me it's more interesting than architecture or football. football for me not. <laughs> uh, but then I would like to, to walk, to walk the place, to find special places, not to have the same uh, wide angles photo of all the mountains, uh, but finding uh, just maybe it's a light, maybe or a it's detail, a, shape. a small yeah, detail. Yeah, maybe it's a, um, a union of uh, some rocks, uh, and maybe uh, find a, a point of view. Okay. I, I used to work with uh, long lenses, uh, better than wide angle, because uh, they make you think what you want inside of the composition and what is going to get outside. Okay. Uh, with I wide see. angles, uh, I used to find maybe. Um, something uh, in front of me to put uh, as a uh, co-protagonist. I don't know if I'm spelling it right. It's uh, yes, co like a, a, a first okay. term, a first term and the landscape and to share the importance. I see. Okay. But usually long lens and try to find uh, maybe a composition, maybe some shapes, some light. What they do is to photograph what people can go, can see. Mm -hmm. Just to show in a different way, uh, let's say if I'm in Montserrat, uh, the, the way that monks are living there, inside the monastery, there are well, the wonderful places, incredible, the, this time of peaceful, of, of praying, about, about the people, uh, just to be the, the trans, transmission, to transmit mm -hmm. what thousands or thousands, hundreds of thousands of people can see, but with my small camera, I am all the way to, to go to, to, 
go. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's anyway, quite well. I would like to, to say something to the audience. Please stop taking pictures of Montreal, Camp Nou, <laughs> and Sarah Familia, please, for the love of God. Turn off your cameras when you go there because we already, we don't need your picture of these places. Just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's right, Mireya. Yes, well, let's uh, stop uh, for a moment because we'll take a short break and we'll be right back with Mark Broderick and the mystery question. Are you a beast or a pet? Don't miss our Guess What quiz about animals presented by Sergi Cervera with Mario Serra and Patricia Scalona. Welcome back. We have been uh, discussing about astonishing travel and nature photographs with uh, Tino Soriano and Marta Bretto. Also, Mireia Giro has brought her point of view about the social impact of photography on the internet. And now it's time for all of them to go through our mystery question with Mark Broderick. Hello. Hello, How's Mark. How's it going? Well, obviously you understand that I'm going to hand you a question, but I have a question that you can answer while the questions are coming, okay? Yeah. So, uh, I'll hand you a question. What's the most ridiculous photo that you've ever taken? Or like the funniest photo that you've ever taken? A selfie. <laughs> and Mireya as well? Is it a Yeah, joint? absolutely, you have so to, it's yeah. one for each. And what's the most ridiculous or funny photograph that you've ever taken? One that you looked at and you go, oh my God, what the hell have I done here? I'm not really sure. No. Uh, <laughs> Everything turns out perfectly all the time? <laughs> yeah, I just don't, don't, don't feel she like doesn't there's take something really pictures, funny. Uh, Mark. I think the most funny picture I have is my, it, it's, it's even a selfie. Uh, the one I have on my profile, yeah. it's myself holding what it lasts from my last camera. <laughs> just a piece of it because I am very unlucky with cameras and sometimes they explode or They explode, die you have exploding cameras. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Mission Impossible, in three With minutes your camera will explode. Also, it's okay. something about technology. I, I don't know what happens to me and technology. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite well, typical. Have a look, open up and, yeah. okay. and read out the question and uh, we'll One go at a time. and start so, first. Um, and Martha Tino, what about first. you? You said the most ridiculous photo you took as a selfie, right? Anything, uh, any ID picture, passport picture, but uh, okay. I, I've taken a picture of Mona Lisa walking. This was a Whoppers photo in, in 1999. It's not ridiculous, but it's a funny picture. Okay, good. It was a what with the most important price in the world, Mona Lisa walking. Nice. We're going to take a selfie afterwards, just so yes. you can, you can, you can add it to your collection of the most ridiculous photos that you're going to take. I'm wishing. And you said, you said the most important thing about a selfie is the thing behind, right? Yes. So I think, Marcella, you should be the most important focus of the photograph. So you can go behind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you, Mark. so can you read the question, please? Well, yes. it's what was the last time you won a bet? I am. There you go. I, I don't remember betting, but <laughs> uh, it's uh, really hard to say. Uh, what I, I really don't know. You never I'm bet so on sorry. anything. Mm, no. No. Well, it's very no, possible. Well, it's, it's a difficult. It's not it's that I have any problem with betting, but <laughs> it's a tricky question. Yeah. Maybe, maybe maybe we can give you another one to have a look at, and Tino can answer. Yeah, while may, we're, maybe, yeah maybe. Just to give you another Thank opportunity. You. Yes. No, no problem. There oh, you go. Thank you so Tino, much. Tino, give it a go. No, well, it's difficult. Last time you were caught telling a lie. Uh, ah, maybe ah, I see ah, someone. No uh, you are really handsome. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> just, you were taking photographs of people and telling them how handsome they were. Yes, well, yes, you were yes, behind yes. the camera. Yes, 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 yes. But uh, in in this case, the the, the girlfriend say, no, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you must have paid a lot of money for well, that. Well, it was yeah. a white lie. And Mireya? Um, what superpower would you like to have? Okay, so I, I would like to cure diseases, for instance. Okay. <laughs> and also great. being invisible sometimes. What would you do if you were invisible sometimes, curing your, diseases? Go to your home and see what you do in your, in your home. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd be quite shocked to know what I do in my home, but anyways, yeah, that's for yeah, another yeah, that's yeah. A conversation Mira, offset. Yeah, Mira, maybe it's better not to know what he does when he's uh, home alone. <laughs> now, now, you're the only... The invisible is right. <laughs> the invisible <laughs> one is a good one. The photographer is, is, is our dream. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, an invisible camera also, I, because if you are invisible, but the camera is not invisible. It's more interesting. You see the camera <laughs> on and answer. <laughs> that must be <laughs> about the faces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the okay. first person that has got a second chance, I believe. Oh, let's see, so because let's it's see very if you hard can do again. it. It's not a Cat9 Live, so go yeah, for it. Yeah, it's very hard again, I think. What have you seen that you wish you could and see? <laughs> so I, I understand what? it's that I wish not who, to, to have seen it. Exactly, like ah. your parents having sex. You really don't want to see that again. I'm so lucky that I haven't yeah, seen that. Yeah, exactly. That's something you really don't want to see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think maybe the, the... I don't know if it's a good answer, but maybe the news. Uh, okay. To see the news, because sometimes the news only speak about uh, bad things, you know? Uh, in fact, when I, I think Tino will agree with me when you want to travel to another country, uh, like for example, I, I, I told you I went to Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, if, you ha if you see the news coming from Pakistan and uh, <laughs> this kind of uh, places, yeah. everything is so bad. Uh, it's like uh, everyone is a terrorism, uh, mm. a terrorist. And then nobody w would want to go to that yeah. place, uh, isn't well, you it? You almost got destroyed by an avalanche. I yeah, really don't want to go there the either. I mean, you haven't actually made it sound well, any better. Um, <laughs> but um. it's true that uh, you have to see the things by yourself because uh, if you only know the bad things, uh, even it was possible that nobody was coming to Barcelona or to Spain, <laughs> uh, if you only say the bad things in here. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. it's true. That's a well, good answer. Mark, I think Thank you can yes. be satisfied I am with very the satisfied, answers. yes. I'm looking, uh, but no, I won't say anything. Mireia, do you would like to um, ask them something before we go? Yeah, I, uh, what are what are you on? Or what are you preparing? Your your not next project you have? Our projects in photography. Well, uh, I am uh, working on a project about the uh, Icelandic Arctic fox. Uh, I've been working on that for since. 2014, and I think I still have to work on it uh, at least one year or two. Uh, and personally, I am just planning w which will be the, the next adventures as uh, treks. Maybe Alaska, maybe Kamchatka. Just oh. still wow. I'm thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Oh. I'm working about traditional medicine in the world. So my next project in July is going to be to go to Peru to photograph shamans mm -hmm. in Peruvian shamans and also in, in Peruvian Amazon. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably in, uh, also in July or in, in October, to, uh, I will lead also a group, but I will, uh, I will go a few days before to make the contacts and to take my own pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Nice. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Tino and uh, Marta, for coming uh, to the program. Thank you, Mireya. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mark. I'll see you in a bit, but I think before you I'd like said to do a wanted... selfie, yeah. yeah, yeah. Remember, the oh, focus no. of the selfie is the, the person behind, right? According to Tino, who's the expert <laughs> of yeah, selfies, yeah. even though he doesn't want All to right, admit it. All right, let's go for it. Now, let's give it a go. But hold on okay. a minute. No, that, means, that means, Mireya, how about like a, like a football team? You kind of ah, like okay. kneel down there. Let's well, see. <laughs> I'm so hold short on. that I think I don't need to move. You don't need to move, <laughs> no? Okay, hold on, let me so... see. I'll go from here. Wait. Are you sure, Tino, you want to do this? Wait. Yeah. Are you uh, sure missing, you want to do this? Who am I missing? Oh, here we go, um, there we go. Ready? Hey, you know? Okay, the woman with the Arctic fox. Yeah. There we go, okay. Yeah, that's definitely the most ridiculous photo of Tina we have. Absolutely, yeah. well done. Well done. Well done, Mark. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> At least you have a sense of humor. <laughs> well, thank you again, Tino and Marta and Mireya. Until and next time. Afterwards. Yeah, that's a picture. <laughs> well, um, nature and landscape are an endless source for idioms and sayings in any language, and English is no exception. But if you don't know any of them, there's no need to make a mountain out of a molehill because Tim Wari from International House Barcelona is about to teach you some of them. Hi again. So today we're looking at expressions related to the countryside. Now, two good friends of mine, Jack and Evelyn, have recently got together, but I didn't know this. Everybody else knew, but I didn't. And suddenly when I discovered, I was like, wow, when did they get together? And all my friends said to me, do you live under a rock? So to live under a rock is to be someone who doesn't realize something that everybody else knows. Now the rumors 
about Jack and Evelyn had been going around for quite a, a long time. And one person told another person who told another person. And then when it came to me, I could say that I heard it on the grapevine. This means I heard it by word of mouth, by one person telling another, telling another. That is also the, the name of a really good Marvin Gaye song that I recommend you look up. Now, opinions and rumors are very important. We need to know which way the wind is blowing. We need to know what the general opinion of the public is or our group of friends. Really good politicians always know which way the wind is blowing. They always know the general op opinion of the public, for example, so they can make their opinions fit. Um, not the real wind, of course. It's just people's opinions. But some people tend to make a mountain of a molehill. A mole hill, a mole is a little animal, a little rodent that burrows and digs, okay? And it makes these tiny little hills. Some people tend to make what is only a very small hill, a very small problem, into a huge mountain, a very big problem. We can use geography to talk about problems quite a lot. Another one is to be up shit creek, or up shit creek without a paddle. This one's a little bit uh, rude. Uh, this just means that you're in a very bad situation, okay? A creek's like a river. Imagine you're uh, in a canoe paddling up the river, and you're up the creek, you lose your paddle, you're in a bad situation. Maybe you go on holiday, you have your wallet and your phone stolen. Um, you could say, I'm up shit creek without a paddle. Um, but then, if they steal your passport as well, things can really go downhill. Now, to go downhill just means to get worse. But imagine that you find your passport all of a sudden. Maybe it was in your bag or in your hotel room. You can say, whew, I'm out of the woods, OK? To be out of the woods means to be out of trouble or to mean the worst part of the problem has passed. So those are our expressions related to the countryside. Put them into practice. What role does Lampurda play in the love story between Jeanette de Cesaris and Joseph Llorenz? Don't miss Love in Translation. Time to play now with guess what? Our resilient contestants Patricia Scalona and Marusera are ready to give another go at our weekly quiz under the command of our unstoppable quiz master Sergi Cervera. Patricia and Marius, welcome. Thank and you. And Sergi, what have you prepared for today? All right. Well, uh, today the show focuses on landscapes. But where are natural landscapes without wildlife? Today I have decided to pay homage to animals. So, how is your wild side going? <laughs> very, well, very well. Very <laughs> well. Sergi, I think these two have been born to be wild. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I feel like a snake. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. So we'll start. The snake and Patricia with oh, our oh multiple. My God. This is no, going to no, be fun. And, and, this and, is going to be fun. Patricia ah, my with God, a multiple my choice and the relationship between people and animals. And we have been out there and interviewed some of them. So I'm um, some of them. I mean people. And ah. we asked them <laughs> about their pets. So what's the next video? Well, I have usual pets. So I have two dogs, <laughs> little dogs. All right. So. What privileges do her two dogs enjoy? A. They sleep in her bedroom and go to the swimming pool. <laughs> it's an option. Yeah. B. They sleep in her bedroom and she cooks Thai food for them. Thai food. <laughs> and C. She takes them to a restaurant for dogs. What do you think? <laughs> what do you guys think? People are really, <laughs> really weird. Yeah. So, yeah. and they restaurant really for dogs? Restaurant for dogs. for dogs. Okay, C for Patricia. And A for me. A for Just Marius. sleeping and... Yeah. They sleep in Going the bedroom to the swimming pool. and go to the swimming pool. All right, so let's see what the right answer is. They eat uh, in our kitchen and they have uh, a bed <laughs> in our bedroom. <laughs> On summer, we go to a swimming pool <laughs> that is especially for dogs. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> one point for Mario. How did you know? But she said uh, swimming pool, special for ducks? 
Uh, I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. My God. I don't think in the regular swimming pools you can actually take your dogs, can you? I don't know. I don't, know. I, I, I don't think so. Maybe you can take them, but they can't swim. They can't. <laughs> are are oh, no. we allowed to go to that swimming pool? No. I mean, like, would, you would, are. would it be? Am I, right? Yeah, <laughs> especially for dogs. <laughs> yeah. you, you can swim like it a dog. To, it has to happen. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, let's so uh, one point for Marius. One point for Marius yes, and, and none for Patricia. <laughs> Good, okay, then yeah. let's go for the second question. <laughs> now it's time to ask about phobias. Check it out. I've always been afraid of sharks. Why? Uh, I don't know, because I'm, I think I feel helpless in the sea. I cannot do anything about it when it, maybe when a shark comes. And how did this man try to overcome his fear of sharks? Oh my God. Let's see the options. And if you, if you score this answer, I'm going to start like dancing like Chris, because I'm going to be happy, because you are going to have one point. Yeah. Is that OK for you? Like, <laughs> I, I love, like I'd this? love that. You'd love that. All right. A, he immersed himself inside <laughs> a cage surrounded by white sharks. B, he went to the cinema to see a shark movie. And C, he bought himself a fluffy shark and tried to sleep with it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> B? <laughs> and for you, Marius? Well, A would be the more logical one, but... Uh, but we are not in a logical, not in a logical way. way so. Not fluffy uh, no. anyway, so I would say V. I'm sorry, but v. I will say... Yeah, you I'm call me. You I'm you both are cinema going. with you. All right, so you both are going after B, so let's watch uh, the video. Yeah, I, I went to a movie. Uh, like for a couple of months ago where it was a really big shark uh, just to like try to uh, get more knowledge or get comfortable with the shark but I, I don't know it didn't went well <laughs> <laughs> a promise is a promise <laughs> so, <laughs> no, guys. point for both okay i'm gonna enjoy this so much yeah <laughs> okay are you afraid of any animals do you have any phobias i'm not very fond of rats rats but I've never actually had, I never faced one, like... Go to the up. cinema. No, no. <laughs> to, to, to see mouse. And uh, see a film mouse. called... Rats. Rats. <laughs> 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 All right. So, guys, are we going to watch the third video now? So, so let's talk about, not rats, but cats. Ah, oh my God. The good ones. All right. Let's see the video. Um, when I was a child, I used to have uh, hamsters or fishes, nothing to be, because we were living in a small house, and a cat as well. And the question is, what was the name of her cat? Oh. A. Sparks, because once they electrocuted him accidentally, of course. B. They called it Goku, and they imagined that the cat became yellow when it was really hungry, angry. And C. It was called Shirukan, and they painted him like a tiger. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you go first this time, and I'll yeah, see if yeah, I copy see. you. I'll, I'll say C. 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 Nice. C. And painted, and painted <laughs> yeah, like a tiger. I love it. And for you, are you copying him, or you are going to nah, go for your own option? I'm going to go for B. B. <laughs> B for Patricia. So they called it Goku and Shirokan for Marius. Let's watch the answer. His name was Goku, like uh, the the cartoon. So it was he was black. And we, me, my sister and my brother, we were thinking that uh, when he was hungry, he became yellow. <laughs> right, so we are even now. Two points for Marius and unbelievably two points for Patricia as people well. People is very strange. Unbelievably, <laughs> strange people, yeah. I said unbelievably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now it's time for you to use your ring bells in a two-round speed challenge. Yeah, we are after the name of famous fictional animals and I will give you a clue and you have to ring your bell and say the name. Bing, bing, ready? Ooh. Ready like ready? <laughs> yeah. An orca that needs to be saved. Patricia. Really? That's correct. A bear who's friend with a tiger. Patricia. Winnie. That's correct. <laughs> a <laughs> dolphin that flips. Marius. Flipper. That's correct. Disney's rodent. Marius. Rodent. Rodent. Ro uh, rodent. That's like mouse. Yeah. That Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. That's, that's correct. correct. And a friend rabbit. Patricia. Rabbit. That's correct. Very well. A small dog that traveled to 
Oz. Oh. A small dog that traveled to, to Oz. Uh, five, four, three, two, toe. one. Toe. But toe, toe. That's correct. <laughs> toe, toe. Correct. Bootstock's best friend. Which, uh... Bootstock's best friend. Mine. So, so big. Absolutely. Well. Right. An orange cat. Patrice Garfield. Garfield. Oh. Correct. The gallant pig. The Say gallant pig. Pig like. You know? Yeah, but gallant pig. Yeah, but. Like gentle and gallant. I just love you, you doing love... that. I know. <laughs> very very lovely. lovely. I A very lovely pig. <laughs> very lovely and gallant. And <laughs> pink. Pink. Yeah, uh, but I can't remember, I can't remember, that remember that name. the name of it. And uh, very uh, smart. Yeah. And posh. A little bit posh. A little posh. Yeah. A little, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit posh as well. I can't remember. Three. How was it? Two. No. One. Uh -uh. Time's up. Babe. 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 And last one. A dog with a composer's name. Patricia. Beethoven. Correct. Absolutely. Job well done, guys. Patricia is winning and leading with eight points, but Marius is following right after with five. Mm -hmm. The next round is about idioms? Absolutely, yeah. Let's go with the second round and Marcello is going to read out a, a definition and I am going to read the example sentence that you guys have to finish. Oh, I mean, I finish the idiom, okay. right? One. Sometimes Sergi is really, really stubborn Sometimes. and he won't do a serious quiz. Mm, I think she's trying to tell me something. Of course, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it... Drink, 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 <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Well done. Okay. Well done. We continue. Last time, said he was late, Eventually. and he said he got trapped in traffic, in a traffic jam. But actually, he can't drive. A lame excuse, or in other words, a cock and bull. Lie. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. No. <laughs> cock and bull story. Uh -huh. yeah. Story. Oh my God. Actually, we mentioned those uh, those idioms in our tips in previous uh, weekly max. So now we are just checking who paid attention and who didn't. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, number three. Okay. Although Sergi is an experienced actor, he still gets nervous before getting on stage. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have butterflies in my Mario. stomach. Absolutely oh, correct. Done. Number four, said he gets so excited during the rehearsals Ooh. for the show that I sometimes have to tell him to cool down. Oh yeah, that's totally true, because she always says to me, hey Sergi, hold your... Horses. Horses. Correct. Horses. And the last one, one said he tried to sell his old broken car and he just painted a couple of bumps and put a car air freshener, but that didn't work at all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. The solution was like putting lipstick on a... Marius. Pig. 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 Excellent. Correct. And actually that's a contradiction between um, option two, which means that the, the screenwriter wasn't paying attention a little bit because he said that I wasn't driving a car and now he's saying <laughs> that I'm selling my car. <laughs> Just so you know. You're selling it because you're not driving it anymore. Yeah, okay. Debbie. Uh, so you the first score is... Without driving um, it. So the score is Mario Patricia. Mario, seven points. Patricia, ten points. Correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, all right, so... We've oh. got one more challenge left. Yeah, maybe? absolutely. One round of the challenge of clues. And as always, table can be turned at the very last minute. And as always, we have made a change. I knew you would love it. Yeah. And today, the sooner you answer, the worthier this challenge will be. Eight points if you guess it with the first clue, seven oh. um, with the second one, and so on. That's actually fair. I'm surprised. <laughs> first time. Yeah. First time. <laughs> I have a question. That's on camera. Uh, <laughs> if we just fail, Mm -hmm. We fall eliminated or not? We're gonna be forever eliminated. eliminated no, just forever? kidding, just kidding. We're gonna welcome <laughs> so you. So we happily. have more than one chance at eight, at seven, at six. At <laughs> okay, I will ring anytime. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Ring anytime, but then you have to bring the answer oh, yeah, quite fast. Yeah. You, you know anyway. you're cheating, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> I'm a cheater. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> shall I start? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are you yeah, ready? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. Ready? Okay, so eight points. In the story, this animal does not talk. The animal does not talk. Seven points. This animal is neither a bird nor a fish. Six points. It belongs to a novel 
from the 19th century. Five points. This animal has got a proper name which has eight characters, eight letters. <laughs> Oh, guys. Four points. Wow. This animal is responsible for the loss of a character's leg. Just four points. Yeah. And three points. Now three points. Patricia. Moby Dick. Correct. Yes. Oh, that's that's correct. not a fish. You said. I said it's not a fish, exactly. It's a <laughs> Let's see the, mammal. the other clues. It's mammal. a mammal. Yeah. In, in the sea. <laughs> okay, this animal is a mammal that lives in the sea and uh, the book was written by Herman Melville. Correct, yeah. Moby Dick was the most famous whale in the history of literature. And actually, Melvin was inspired by two real albino sperm whales. And one of them was called Mocha Dick that had survived many encounters with whalers before it was killed. Did you guys know that? No. Impressive. So the score right now is like this. Patricia is leading with 14 points and Marius is going uh, with seven points. Mm -hmm. That's well, great. Seven fair That's points. A double. Double. <laughs> double. Double for her. So have you liked the book, Moby Dick, Patricia? I did like it when I read it. Although there were parts, you know, when he describes all the, the business, the fisherman business, <laughs> it was a bit heavy, but it's interesting. Well, I remember that Woody Allen, uh, for instance, said always he tried to read Moby Dick and never no. ended. Succeeded. Yeah. Succeeded. yeah, because it's it's a, a real interesting novel, but it's a very long one and it's uh, in a different way. So for, for an actual reader, it's quite slow, a yeah. slow reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, so much for Guess What? And let's start Guess Word by Mario Serra. So, Mario, can you remind us the last clue for this uh, week's puzzle? Yeah, last week it was main purposes with balls. <laughs> <laughs> that balls uh, meant uh, going to football. football yeah? Of course. Yes, of, of course. course. And the answer was goals. Goals. Yes. Great. Yeah. Of course. You're good at because, that. Because uh, yeah. goal is a purpose, but it's always uh, those, uh, well, the, the structure that you have to put the ball inside. Inside. Amazing. Yeah. And our goal for next week is to crack uh, the following guess word, which That's it. is... It's a movement constantly invoked by cinema directors. Six letters. A movement constantly invoked by cinema directors. Six letters. A six-letter word that is a movement constantly invoked by cinema directors. Let's see how fast you can crack it and post it on our uh, social media profile. Patricia, Marius and Sergio, thank you. See you thank next you. week. Thank you. And uh, we'll take a three-minute break now, but don't go away. We'll be right back with our new section, Love in Translation and the Balkan Paradise Orchestra. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. First met Janet in our program dedicated to accents and today it's time to meet her husband Josep and also find out about their love story which began in the 80s. So it's time to watch our new section Love in Translation with Janet de Cesaris and Josep Lorenz. Don't miss it. <laughs> My name is Josep, Josep Llorenç. I'm from Figueres, the best county, L'Empordà. My name is Janet, Janet de Cesaris. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. and I've lived in Catalonia now for over 30 years. We first met when I was a student on an exchange program between Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana and the University of Barcelona. And I was given housing in a Collège Major and that's where Josep was living also. So we met there. For the young generation, it like, was like uh, Erasmus. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, 
de l'Empordà uh, was very important for the relationship because the first weekend that I um, yeah that we sort of went out yeah uh. we visited the Cadaqués and uh, and Cadaqués I think was the the first uh, time that I thought that the I can invite her yeah. for a, a trip. In the end, I went back to the United States to finish my studies. Then I, I ended up here, and we got married in 1987. The strong sense of identity that people have here, I, I, that surprised me a lot. In the United States, we have a sense of identity, but it's not as local as it is here. So he's mentioned he's from the Emporda, but people from Tarragona, if you go to Tarragona or Reus, the first thing they tell you is that they're from Tarragona, not Reus, or they're from Reus and not Tarragona. So this local sense is very important here, and that's not so true in the U.S. For me, but for our family, it's very important, some traditionals from the States. It would be terrible to not have Thanksgiving. The Christmas, it's a little different. I always remind people when it's the 4th of July. So, uh, although I do not put a flag outside of our house uh, for an American flag. not. Uh, American culture in general is pretty flexible. In some sites, mm -hmm. in our house, the life is like America. Yeah, our... we live outside the main city, so we live in what the U.S. would be called suburb suburbs. We both have cars and drive. No, we do not have a dog, which is what probably we would have in the U.S., but in that sense, our life is very similar to life in an urban area in the U.S. Oh heavens, I think. <laughs> very big list. No. <laughs> okay. I should have written more falta, no? No, you wrote it right. Yeah. Cooking. You asked for cooking? Yeah. <laughs> For the traditional food like uh, Thanksgiving uh, explained it uh, before, but uh, his grandfather was from Montelanico, close to Rome. She made a, a very good, good Italian food. Actually, I don't know. <laughs> really bad at, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's true that uh, I have a very bad uh, skills in one thing. Oh, I don't know. I mean... Yeah, it's true. We well, I'm going to put this down because... But it's not no, actually true. No, but not only the, the things at home. My worst skill in at the wall... <laughs> is speaking English. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> I put comes with good language. <laughs> That's how you write languages. Yeah. <laughs> Ironing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was a long time ago. <laughs> we both said me. <laughs> or we did it at the same time. Maybe. Have you ever been to a squat house? Today, you'll get to visit one guided by Joey, our home from home protagonist of today. They are 11 instrumentalists, wind and percussion. They share a passion for Balkan tradition and they put rhythms from all over the world into the mix. And the result is an energetic, joyful and fresh fanfare show both on the stage and in the street. They are the Balkan Paradise Orchestra, also known as BPO. Well, we have here Alba Careta and Maria Kofan. Welcome. Thank you. 
And the obvious question is, why Balkan music in the first place? Well, uh, the three of us that they started the project, they started with the idea of playing Balkan music mostly for the rhythm because it's very danceable and they like it so much, so this was the first idea. How did you discover Balkan music? Um, we, well, these three persons, they went to a, in a concert of Fanfarecio Carlio and they, and they, they also knew um, Balkan music like long ago. And then when they saw the, the, this concert, it was like super nice for, for them. So they said, why, why don't we do a group of this music? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not easy to play Balkan music. Um, if you're not from um, a country uh, from Eastern Europe or Central Europe in this case, uh, which are your main um, musical points of reference, apart from uh, Fanfara Chokrlia, which you mentioned before? Yeah, also we listen a lot to Goran Bregovic and we play some versions of the films from Emir Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Kataka is the name of your first album. First of all, what does this word mean, Kataka? I guess you have to tell that. Yes, um, Maria. Kataka is, is how um, me and the horn play, is a, is a comping um, of, of, the, of the melody. And the, the comping we do is a rhythm that when we play is kata, kataka, kata, kataka. And, and that's why we, we put this name of, of the disc. Mm -hmm. I see. And what is the album like? I would say that uh, uh, the album is all the versions that we start with. Uh, when we start with the group, we, we picked some versions that we liked from this reference that I told before. And we did our own arrangements, so uh, we had to present them somehow. So we record this first uh, Kataka with all these versions. Well, you are 11 members in this band, all girls and well, women, um, compared to Fanfara Chakrlia, which are all men, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay, so tell me, why 11 and why all girls? We, we started, no, we, when we started, we were 11, we were like less. And we are 11 because we are, um, we, we started playing and then we, we were thinking, oh, maybe we need another girl that plays this or maybe we need an... And that's how we, we ended being 11. Okay. And being girls is just because the friends, we were girls. And, and then we said, why not all girls? And exactly, why not? Mm -hmm. um, it's all about wind and percussion. It's a wind and percussion uh, orchestra. So why not other instruments as well? We like it to be this formation, also because we started in the streets playing. Um, so then if you have other instruments that you need to plug or you need amps or, or whatever, uh, it's difficult to play there. And also because our reference, I, as we said, like Fanfarri Chocarli, they are also this formation of instruments. So we picked the idea from that. Mm -hmm. I see. All right, and in order to, to, to train and um, also um, find inspiration for the music that you do, um, have you traveled to, to the Balkans? Not well, really. Some, some of us, they, they yes. did. But um, the way that we used to, to learn it is just by listening it, listening it and repeating it, like trying to get the same sound as they do. And that's the way also to move 11 people. It's so hard always to travel with all the yeah. instruments and everything. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to uh, maybe in the future uh, do some other kind of music like world music and, and traditional music from, from other places uh, in the world? Now we are preparing our next, next albums. Okay. And we are um, compos composing our own tunes. So mm, this time we are, we are trying to get Balkan, but not like super, um, like world, mu world music, super like this. You recently won uh, a very important award, which is the best folk album 2018, uh, Premis on the Rock 2019. It was a popular vote, so it was, um, uh, it was a big uh, event for you. What did it mean for you as a band? Well, it was great. I mean, having this super also from the, the people, because it was votation. I mean, if we would not have people that they support us, we could not win that. So it's nice to see that 
also out there there's people that they listen to us and they vote for us so it's a, a big relief to know that what we are doing people like it you said that you started to play uh, on the street in the streets but you also play on stage um, what's uh, more difficult it's different it's different yes in the street it's it's nice because people are next to you and and you are only playing with your own um, like you are playing and you don't have any um, amplification and that's super beautiful because you, you can do lo lots of dynamics and and you can and in the stage is different because well there's there's um always a um at the instance and i see it's do you have lots of concerts yeah in catalonia <laughs> mostly or outside catalonia as well most of our concerts are here although now from may on we are going to start to go abroad Mm -hmm. We have now some concerts, I guess, in... In Norway, we are playing. Then we are playing also in, in Istanbul, in Germany, in France. France. And I think that's all abroad, no? Yeah. I think the best way is for the people to check out at our webpage. It's okay, so your website, which is? Uh, bpo.cat. BPO.cat. Yeah. Excellent. Well, and uh, today you're going to play something for us. What are you going to play? We're playing a song named Unza Unza Time. And it's a song for, from a film of Emir Kusturica. And um, we're going to perform a little part of us, not 11 of us. <laughs> but wow, Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming, Alba and Maria. And good luck with all the gigs and, and with the tour as well. Thank, and you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Living as free as a bird is one of Joey's main goals in life. Born in Australia, he traveled the world and enjoyed lots of adventures until he ended up living with a group of close friends in Catalonia. And our home from home section features the squid house where they live and it is well worth a visit. Hi, my name is Joseph Alistair and this is our squad house. Come in. Welcome. This is the house. I lived in a shitty small town in Australia on a farm and basically decided when I was 18 that I was never going to go back. Coming from a normal life and normal society and hating it so much <laughs> and to find these people was like so refreshing. You know? It was exactly what I've been looking for my whole life. So obviously I had to stay. <laughs> The neighbours don't think, I don't think they like us very much, he's pretty chill. But, I mean they've got that camera pointing at us all the time. And they had three, they had three cameras and they took two of them down but they left one, you know? So. We have morals, we have like, we're super high principled people and I think half, half of the group has been to um, university for philosophy so we are quite against stealing from people or doing anything that hurts other people but as you know corporations have no body and have no soul so we always take our occupied houses from the banks. When I was a kid <laughs> I imagine the falling down house, all the windows and doors are broken, like a mattress on the ground and just heroin needles everywhere. You know, one guy, like one, maybe two heroin needles in his arm and a belt and like uh, dying there in the house, you know, and maybe a cat and some rats living in there. That was my opinion of a squat when I grew up, you know. And now you've been in here, it's, it's just, I mean, people live in normal houses that are dirtier than this, so you can see the difference. <laughs> Um, recycling is really good in Spain, we're blessed, we're so lucky, the supermarkets throw so much food out, you know, we can live from that, you get the 
effort to get off your ass and go down there and take it from the bin, it's there. But as well, we're obviously buying some stuff, um, breads and rice and milk, cheap things, heavy things, you know. And there's a market in town on, I think, Saturday mornings. And they go there after the market and recycle. You saw all that food in the kitchen, you know, boxes and boxes of vegetables and fruit and stuff, so. Catalonia has always been um, about liberty and independence and freedom and anarchy and all this stuff, you know, you see it in the, the freestyle art that they make here on the buildings, you know, all the ceramics in the buildings, Gaudi and John Miro and whoever else. We want more from life than just working and paying the mortgage and this is the answer we've found. You know, just seeking the necessary things in life, you have to go through the system and work and work and work and pay the mortgage. And the system takes so much from you, you know, just using you like a slave, they're putting you inside this thing and using you up. And part of living like this is to move past that and just see life for what it is, you know, it's an experience to, and we're enjoying it, you know, we're trying to, trying to live it to the fullest between the cracks of the system, you know, to get, to get past it. there are many words related to walking. Well, depending on your mood, on your speed or your aim, the verb is different. And if you want to know how many words there are and learn a few of them, let's watch the following language tip with Tim Guinea from International House Barcelona. And I also bet you like his story. Watch.
Today we've been talking about the countryside, and my favourite activity is to go walking through the countryside. But have you noticed in English there are lots of different ways of saying the verb walk? For example, I want to tell you about the last time I went for a walk. Well, I was strolling through the park, and strolling means to walk very relaxed. And I noticed there was a guy walking behind me. And at first I thought he was just wandering. So if you're wandering, you're walking very relaxed as well, but probably without a clear purpose or an aim. But then I noticed that he was still walking behind me some five minutes later, and I got the feeling that he was following me. So I decided to lengthen my stride. So your stride is your step, and if you lengthen it, it means you start to walk a bit faster. So I began to stride away. And I turned around and he was striding right behind me. So I decided I needed to break into a run. So if you break into a run, it means you start running. And guess what? I turned around and he was still running behind me. But luckily, I'm quite a fast runner, so I managed to give him the slip. So if you give someone the slip, it means you get away from them in the physical sense. So I gave him the slip, got back to my car, and I realised I didn't have my keys. So I had to retrace my steps. And that means to go back along the path that I walked, trying to see where I dropped my keys. Unfortunately, I couldn't find them, and I'm searching and I'm searching until all of a sudden I feel a tap on my shoulder, and it was the guy. I was so shocked, I stepped back. The guy must have crept up behind me. So if you creep up behind someone, it means you walk very carefully, very slowly, like animals do when they're trying to hunt other animals. So he crept up behind me and I was shocked. But in the end, he was actually just trying to give me back my keys. Well, I can tell you I was extremely embarrassed and I had to trudge back to the car. So if you trudge, you walk pretty slowly in low spirits, you're not very happy. And I got back to the car and I realised that I had no petrol in the car. So I had to walk all the way home. Well, that's it from me. Until next time, I'll see you. There are many ways of enjoying the landscape and exploring new places. One of them is driving, which in modern life has become almost as normal as walking. And while regulations are almost the same everywhere, the driving culture might be different from one country to another. And let's talk about this with Matthew Tree and Mark Broderick. Hello guys. How's it going? Hi. Good. So tell me, are you good drivers? I, I... I'm a great driver. I'm a fantastic driver. I learned here uh, about f six years ago. Okay. No, I, I don't, honestly, I don't know. I think sometimes <laughs> I drive like a, an old lady and other times I drive like a crazed lunatic. So I'm some are, some are either really, really good or really, really bad. Matthew? So it depends on the day. It depends on the day, exactly. It depends on the yeah, day. I don't drive. You don't drive? No, that's it. You have a chauffeur? Okay. No, I did. I, yeah, it's a good start to the program. Uh, I did try when I was 18. I did lots and lots of lessons, loads of lessons, spent loads of money, and then worked out I didn't have a, failed a test, and then worked out I didn't have enough money to buy a car anyway, so I let it go. And I've never missed driving, ever, since, since then, you know? I've always found ways of getting to places without You've managed without, without it. Without driving. Donkeys and uh, motorbikes, sidecars, things like this. No, well, uh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> Any method Mark, of transport you know, that gets you to the place. Buses and trains. <laughs> buses and trains, there's no well, mystery there. I thought it'd be funnier, you know, you were born in the 1960s. So, also, you know, uh, I was told by someone that, uh, who apparently knew about this, that if you buy a car, okay. it's still more expensive to buy a car than take a taxi all the time in Barcelona. And the in guy Barcelona, was exactly. In Barcelona. It depends where you go. Yeah, no? but By taxi. And he wasn't a taxi driver. I mean, he worked it all out. He calculated it. All right, it so well. it's uh, reliable. Yeah. He had a lot of time in his hands. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, tell me. He was a me, gynecologist. Mark, you've traveled. Um, you've traveled a lot, Mark. I have indeed. Yes. The world. So tell me, uh, in your opinion, uh, which country has the best uh, drivers, mm -hmm. and which country has the the, the worst or oh. most aggressive drivers? Uh, well, honestly, like the best drivers, I think have been, if, from my experience, huh, have been in Holland. They're quite. Uh, mm. They're very, very 
secure. They all drive nice cars. They all, everybody obeys. Everything works well within Amsterdam as well with all the trams and the bicycles. It's amazing that there's not so many, much more accidents than there, than there are. Although my uncle lives there and he drives like a bit of a nutcase. I mean, my most uh, harrowing experiences in the car have been with my uncle. And as regards like the worst places, I mean, any one of China and Iran. I mean, China for me, I remember going on the other side of the road at 200 kilometers an hour with a, with a guy in a van. And it's like in, 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 Te in Tehran, for example, in Iran, they really like, they go against the, the, the grain of the traffic. It's like a white knuckle ride. You're like in the car like this, and you really are like fretting for your life for lack of a better way. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ireland itself, I mean, Ireland, we're, I think we're quite polite. I think in Ireland we're like overly polite. Nobody beeps the horn or like, you know, everybody's like waving out the window and like saying, how's it going? And like letting people pass. And I think it's kind of like the manners mm -hmm. we have as well kind of influences the driving part as well. Mm -hmm. so. Polite drivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. a little bit of a... Yeah, I would say uh, I, I found it very difficult to adapt to Barcelona because Barcelona has, it has a normal system of traffic lights where you, the cars have to stop. They, mm -hmm. they can't do anything other than stop. But they also have far more traffic lights, which in the official name of the city council is Samafos de Precaucio, precaution okay. traffic lights, which are the ones that flash. Mm -hmm. And that means that if there's no one crossing the road, the cars can go through. And if there's someone crossing, in theory, mm -hmm. the cars will stop. But in fact, what I've found, and I'm not the only one, what you have to do when you're crossing with a semaphore de precaucio is you have to stare at the cars and make sure that they can see that you are actually crossing the road. And if possible, look them in the eye, you know, to, to, to For make it clear. For more than three seconds. For more than three seconds, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I still find that quite... Um, quite tricky. I, I actually failed my first driving test here because because of those uh, traffic lights of Precocio and uh, it says in the rule book, I learned to drive here, it says in the rule book that even if there's somebody walking on the side of it, uh, that you have to stop the car anyways. You understand? Like mm. even if the person is walking past the actual zebra or uh, flashing light crossing you have to stop I almost ran over a small uh, an old lady uh, yeah they, they stopped the test but on the second time I got it so it was okay uh, okay <laughs> well um, where do you think that um, uh, the traffic lights and signs are most uh, respected in, in London I've never seen anybody run a red light ever uh, they mm. take all that in fact traffic moves quite slowly in London mm. Um, which was one of the reasons why you have to pay money to go through the centre of London because before that it was almost impossible because everybody stops at the right moment, stops at zebra crossings even if there's no traffic light and so forth. In Barcelona constantly I've seen people run red lights, go through the flashing lights. Uh, you refer to, to drivers? To drivers, What about yeah. pedestrians? Pedestrians, are oh, you mean going across people, the road when exactly. they shouldn't be going across if the road? If you have a, a red light but you still cross the... the yeah, pedestrian. if there are no cars coming, we all do that. It's fair game. Really? Open it's game. fair game. It's fair yeah. game. Yeah? Yeah. Talking about like uh, silly things that they do here as regards, something I always found funny was uh, people driving up the middle of a town, like a small town in Catalonia, and then just putting on the warning lights and getting out and going into the shop. <laughs> it's yeah. like, this is something that happens here like all the time. And you're just, you're in the car behind, you're like, really, he just went in to buy tobacco or he went in to buy the newspaper? This would never happen in Ireland. Like this would be like the biggest lack of respect you could do to somebody on the road. Mm -hmm. And as regards pedestrians, I'm, I, I must admit, I think it's a real giddy thing to start running across the road. They don't really do it here that much like the locals from my experience I don't know no no no, no. but the funny thing is when people jump uh, run a run a red light here in Barcelona yeah it's not acceptable you know every time they do it I've seen the pedestrians complain yeah. or even yell at them yeah uh, because it's you know I, I I've heard that in Naples for example it's so normal that people don't even okay. think about it it's not but accepted it's but not it is accepted for pedestrians to cross the street even if the the, the traffic uh, uh, lights are red yeah 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 mm -hmm. or cross the street when there's no zebra crossing oh even? yeah jaywalking yeah. they call it you get arrested you get arrested for that in the states like, I, I think I got stopped once in Canada for jaywalking, which was like not crossing at the right place. Luckily, the policeman was nice and I told him I was from out of town and I didn't know the rules, even though I'd been living there for four years. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I play the giddy card from time to time. It gets okay, me away with things. Um, so where have you been this week? Uh, I went to El Masnau. 
And uh, well, actually, what did drove, you ask them? Actually, drove there. I uh, got to drive a Sharsha car, so I <laughs> hope there wasn't any problem with that. Lucky you. Yeah. So yeah. why did you ask them? And uh, well, that's what kind of drivers they were, and uh, well, general things about driving and uh, funny experiences they had and things like that. So. Okay, let's give it a go. Okay, anger, aggression, frustration, road rage. All of these things we associate with transport and driving. Here on a beautiful Monday morning in Maznao, we have none of those problems. And I, for one, I'm a super chill driver. Tell me, have you ever had a funny or dangerous or ex uh, incredible experience driving or in a car? I crashed the car when I was 15. If I had um, a bus in front of me, I would do all this uh, bus stops behind the, the bus. You wouldn't overtake the bus. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> From here to Mataró, all the way, yes. And I would say, okay, I'm, I'm not in a hurry. I can wait, yes. <laughs> Confuse some drivers. Have you ever had a funny experience while in a bus or a train or a plane or a donkey or a mule or a unicorn in a taxi in Egypt? The Ubers in Malta, they go really crazy. Motorbikes in Southeast Asia. There are rules, but they are unwritten, so it's kind of, there is a flow, like let's say a big fish coming from between. Then they just go, Shh. somehow, you know, there's this flow. It's like an organism. They don't have traffic lights and stuff. The fish just know how to do it. Italy. They are crazy drivers. They do not respect rules, but they do not have accidents. Because everyone pays attention to everything because they all know that they are in constant danger. Driving in Greece, in a, like a two-lane road, you, you get four or five cars. Um, it, because, yeah, the lines don't mean anything. <laughs> These graffiti artists really have a dirty mind. Really clean up this town. In Australia, you have to take care with the, with the wildlife, with kangaroos, koalas. New Zealand, uh, you know, there are penguins. Yeah, they, there is a sign saying, uh, be careful, penguins crossing. Yeah, yeah. Did you see any penguins? Of course, we did. Did you kill any penguins? No. Oh no, they're so cute. No, 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 no. Okay, Monday morning. It was it was a Monday morning. I'm usually at my best on a Monday morning. Would you believe? We I can love, see that. I love grabbing the week by the scruff Holmes. of the neck. <laughs> no, no, I was, going, I was trying to stay away from stay away from saying something nasty. Well, let me ask you about uh, driving in in Ireland. Well, in, in the UK, Commonwealth in general, you guys mm -hmm. uh, drive the on the left. <laughs> Is it strange for you here? Uh, we drive on the right. Is it strange for you to to switch? From right to left when uh, you go back to well, Ireland? Well, as I said, I, I, I did learn how to drive here, so actually it was strange when I went back to Ireland and I rented a car. And uh, it was a hair-raising experience, I must admit. And it must be very difficult to change the bloody gears with your left hand. I mean, that would be my weak hand. I always thought that. So it was kind of funny when you're driving, you kind of don't know. But when you rent a car in Ireland, it's very funny because on the, on the dashboard, there's a huge sign written in three languages, like, so that you know. It's like, keep to the left-hand side of the road, it's written in like Chinese, German, and English. I don't know. I don't know which rental company I used, but I think it was Chinese, German, and English. And the first thing when you get out of the airport in Ireland is you hit four roundabouts before you hit the road. So I mean, like that—that's just testing your skills straight away. It's like right now you got to know which way to go: left, right, right, left. And there's so many people who who do the opposite. So yeah, it's a it's a f tricky experience. Uh, by the way, uh, Matthew, well, you, you said you don't drive, but maybe you can tell us why the Commonwealth drive on the left. It's a fascinating story. Um, it started off on the basis that most people are right-handed. So if you're in the 16th, 17th centuries, you're riding a horse, you need your right hand to have access to some kind of weapon so that you, because it was very common for people ride, riding horses along roads to be attacked. So that was why people uh, went to the left, so that they could have access, their right hand could have access to a weapon. But then later, um, we're coming up to the 18th century now, it becomes normal for uh, what would now be called freight transport to be done by large teams of horses and large wagons. And with the large teams of horses, the driver would sit on the left-hand side so he could use the whip with his right hand, most people are right-handed, but that meant that it was much more convenient to, uh, to drive on the, on the right. And that started, that habit started in, in France. 
And what really matters is that it was in the 18th century that in both Britain and France, driving on the right in Britain, or riding on the right in Britain, and riding on the left in France, were put on the statute books in law. So after that, every time these countries invaded another country, or took over another country, all the statute laws went with them. So quite simply, uh, when you get to the age of the automobile, those laws are already in place and cars just do what horses were doing for the last two centuries. Mm -hmm. thanks, thanks England for that. Well, yes. I, uh, <laughs> yes, thank you England. <laughs> thank you England uh, <laughs> for that. And in fact, funnily enough, they did a survey in England a few years ago, in Great Britain a few years ago, uh, to see how much it would cost. I mean, can you imagine that now with Brexit and everything? But they wanted to follow the European norm and they did a kind of uh, estimate of how much it would cost and it was so expensive uh -huh. that they decided not to not not to go cost ahead with trillions. it trillions you'd have well, to change I knew everybody's everything. steering wheels i knew there was a proper explanation uh, for that uh, yeah. anyway okay um Mark, tell us but about by uh, the way yes. it's 35% of uh, uh, because people think driving on the left is just Britain and a few other countries. It's 35% of uh, countries yeah. drive on the left. Australia, South Africa, Jamaica, no, yeah. India, lots of yeah. African countries. Yeah, uh, quite a lot. Yeah. Anyway, um, what's it like driving in Ireland where oh. the streets are quite narrow compared to other countries you've, uh, you've lived in, for example, Canada? Okay, so first thing, Ireland. Before you take out a rental car in Ireland, make sure you get insurance. And make sure that insurance covers everything, all right? Because once you hit out the west of Ireland where I'm from, the roads get narrower and narrower and narrower. And as you know, they have these stone walls with the stones like jutting out. So you really have to be careful and have your you know, spatial awareness on key because you can easily scratch the side of the car. Because at times it's like funny because it's usually foreigners that are driving against each other and they don't know like that. In Ireland, we always like, we put our, we're always very polite. Was parked to the side and stuff like that so it's tricky make sure you get a good insurance America or Canada on the other hand the first thing that shocked me or the first thing that impacts you when you get out of the airport is the size of the cars the size of the cars then obviously means the roads are huge and in Canada uh, I rented a 4x4 like that would be typical to rent like a big 4x4 and all that SUV or whatever and the roads are huge like they've got massive amount of uh, space for overtaking like obviously they've got all of these RVs these massive recreational vehicles mm. uh, camper vans the trucks are twice and three times bigger so uh, it's not as necessary let's say to have such a good insurance policy that would be my my experience okay. I see. And Matthew, as a pedestrian, have you ever found yourself in a dangerous situation? Here uh, only, or in other places? Only when I go back to London. <laughs> and I almost always, the first two days, I find myself always looking the wrong way and almost getting killed. But it's, it's fortunate that in London, uh, they have something similar to what you were explaining about the, the airports in, in, in Ireland. They yeah. have, on every crossing, they they tell you which way you have to look yeah. because they know you know <laughs> of that course. look left look yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand i have some uh, friends from the uk and every time they come to barcelona to visit they are actually afraid that they would be run over by a car hmm. so uh, it must be something similar yeah right? exactly the same because it becomes so automatic Mm. When, yep. you, when you live in a place. Mm -hmm. and you learn it as a child. We used to learn rhymes as children in school about which way to look and which way to walk. And even now at 36 years of age, I still remember that. And even though I've been living here for 10 years, I, almost, I sometimes do the wrong thing. It's amazing like how it still sticks in your head, no? These little rhymes like, always look to the left, always look to the left. <laughs> that's incredible. I used, that's just reminded me out of the blue that when I was six years old, yeah. I used to belong to, <laughs> to something called the Tufty Club. And Tufty was a squirrel who taught you how to cross the road. It's, it's one of the few clubs, I, I mean, it's that and the Association of Catalan Writers. You know, those are the only two clubs I've ever belonged to. <laughs> Tufty the squirrel and Catalan Writers. That's a nice writers. detail, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, that's to be something funny about that. Hey, that's okay. a good one. Anyway, Mark, uh, yeah. let's watch the second video. Uh, what else have Ooh. you asked the people in uh, Masnou? Well, uh, I managed to get them to ask about uh, have they committed any traffic offences, like have they any, had any problems with the law. Mm. I, of course, have had various uh, <laughs> clashings with the law in regards to the car, um, I must admit. But, uh, well, you'll see. They've come up with a couple of funny ones. Okay, let's see what happened. Have you ever had problems with the law, fines, like any funny experience with policemen in, in other countries here? Yeah, the rented car got towed away. I was really, really mad. 
Um, so yeah, I went all in with the policeman in Portugal and I was like, you know, I feel like I'm being uh, robbed by you. This is how you want to get out of the crisis and blah, blah. In Southeast Asia, I paid the fine. A bribe, that's the one, bribe. In France, we were parking. He hid the, uh, the car behind us. We take the camper and we went away. And the police search us in another village. Uh, in the States, the police is very, are very strictly, no? And they stopped me, they put the car behind my car. And I was, if like, I was like here, I opened the door, I, would, I went down to the car, and the police come with the gun to go to the car, go to the car. Because you put your hands down Because I down, the, I, down, I down the car. I went down the car like it was, it was in here in Catalonia. Uh, there you kind of get out of the car. Yeah, yeah, you have to put the hands over on the, on the, on the dashboard, yes. What's the thing that annoys you most about drivers here? Like things that people do on the road when they're driving? Oh, how people take the roundabouts. People go in the lane which is to the center and then they want to take the exit and then they just, they just don't blink. They just go into your lane and it just drives me crazy. Danny, I think I'm in the wrong lane. Shit. I think we need to get back in the other lane. These roundabouts are sometimes very confusing. I always think if I was the only driver on a road, no problem. I could drive. I'm not afraid of driving, but I'm afraid of being pressured. Touching mobile phone. Touching the mobile phone? Yeah. You mean like on the mobile phone, not like yeah. touching it? No. <laughs> they, I mean the drivers being on the mobile phone. <laughs> Okay, Danny, you've given me a lot of signs to work with today. I'm kind of confused by a lot of them. Maybe here I can find out some, I don't know, some tips. Nice uh, signs. Couple, a couple of things there in that video, actually, that we that uh, we didn't touch on. One is the roundabouts. I think I already talked the about the roundabouts. Yes, exactly. And, that's uh, uh, that's the, an issue. The, the brushes with the law. Have you ever had a run in with the law while you're driving, Marcella? Have you ever no, been stopped? No? Not really. you? Once, um, uh, yeah, I was stopped when, when I was a kid, when my mum and dad were there in France, and the policeman said, Les papiers, les papiers, you know, <laughs> give us the papers. Yeah. So my mum, who didn't really know what he was talking about, but she understood the word papier, just took a piece of notepad paper <laughs> and gave it to him. <laughs> there you go, write yeah. a story. <laughs> we come from a long line of writers. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> nice one. And also the, um, the phones, right? Yeah. The phones, oh, uh, using the phones uh, while you're driving or while you're, as a pedestrian, is a, is a very dangerous thing and it happens a lot, unfortunately. The, the thing now in Barcelona recently is, especially in the last six to 12 months, especially with the pedestrians using the phones, they have these bloody electric scooters and the skateboards and the bicycles and the unicycles and the, the, everybody just thinks that it's open game on the pedestrian area. So I've seen so many accidents of people like walking on, like, you know, texting their grandmothers like, hey, where's the croquetas of the Yaya, whatever, like, and then all of a sudden, like a, a, one of these scooters comes out of nowhere and like they, they wipe out. On, I've seen this like lots of times. Don't get me started on this subject. I have... <laughs> The, the bicycles in Barcelona are absolutely and totally outrageous. Yeah, yeah. You know, they do exactly what they want, and it's terrifying. I mean, you know, yeah. they, they go full speed right through a pavement full of people, uh, and the, the electric uh, oh, the skateboards, electric scooters are, the electric my scooters are really dangerous <laughs> because they're completely silent. And you were talking about Holland earlier, because yes. in Holland it's the one of the few countries which has a complete... Um, bicycle route for the whole country, exactly. so ev everybody yes. knows what, which lane to be on. Mm -hmm. And if, a, in, according to Dutch law, if a driver uh, has an accident with a, a cyclist, it is always the driver's fault. And if a cyclist has an accident with a pedestrian, it is always the cyclist's fault. And I'd like to see that introduced here. You're, you're a couple of years off being an angry old man. Yes! I mean, <laughs> really? We'll soon be the odd couple, except really, really odd in age, and like you'll be the angry one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, what other annoying habits uh, can you think of when it comes to driving? When it comes to or... driving? 
as a pedestrian as well. Yeah. Well, for me, for me as a driver, two things that annoy me: uh, bicycles on the on the on the on the on the country roads, like these groups, these pelotons mm. that take over the whole country road, and you're driving behind them for like. It could be 15 kilometers. I was heading to Tosta de Mar a couple of weeks ago and I was like stuck behind three bikes and you can't overtake them because they don't have the common sense to just like, you know, like move to the side lads. No, they, they occupy the whole bloody thing. And another thing is uh, people's impatience. People are very, very, very quick here to, to, to beep the horn. They're really, really impatient. Uh, even if you're like, typical thing is like the, 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 um, the traffic light goes green and there's like a, a 10 second delay while one of these cars starts up and the people behind just go crazy like the 10 seconds of my life it's going to be lost <laughs> so th those are two things that really really get my get on my nerves so to speak and you as a pedestrian well okay. I'm, I'm looking to the future here when e-bikes <laughs> become popular in catalonia which they are starting to do already because <clears throat> in in holland the bicycling country the best biggest bicycling country they are already putting restrictions on e-bikes because they if we think bicycles and electric scooters are dangerous e-bikes are the very worst because they can go it up to the really fast ones can go it up to 80 kilometers per hour they're completely silent and they use bicycle lanes which are in in barcelona are mainly on the pavement E-bikes. E-bikes. Like e-cigarettes. Electronic bikes. Like, uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> the Electronic same company, bikes. no? Here, smoke yeah. some cigarettes, get some thing and get some exercise at yes. the same time. You can vape and... <laughs> Vaporize and... Well, and now that smoke. you mentioned the, uh, the e-bikes, uh, e okay, uh, we can talk about uh, cars because driverless cars already exist. So, it doesn't matter, Google. Matthew, that you don't drive. <laughs> yeah, but because in the future you probably won't need to. And the question is, do you think there will be drivers in the future? No. I think Elon Musk is onto something. I think it's Elon Musk, no, mm. that Tesla and they're, they're big into this like electric cars and driverless thing. I think that it's not, it's about 10 to 15 years away from maybe mm -hmm. reaching some level of perfection because I think that the trials that they ran in California and things like that, there have actually been accidents of, yeah. I think it was the Google cars, no, I've actually yeah. run over people. It's like, that's not what it's supposed to do. But the Swedish are way ahead. The Swedish, if you uh, even go back a couple of years ago when I was looking to buy a car, I looked at Volvos. Mm -hmm. And Volvos already have an inbuilt system into their cars where it actually will automatically stop it will automatically detect movements on the road and stuff like that. So I think we're almost there, but Matthew, I think you'll probably be retired by the time you'll we'll be able to sit in a car and be driven around. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for that. Uh, that, that I'll push little, you around if you want. Little, <laughs> that's the best, I, that's the best I, I can do. I've lost the words, you know, I'm, yeah. and as you know, I'm so yeah, me too. with age. Me I'm too. I'm I kidding, am. Okay. Um, but okay, Mark, I'm, the, I'm the oldest person on this program, I'll, I admit it. Well, but meanwhile, uh, Mark, I know that you have a little surprise for us today. Always I have a little surprise for you. Well, I try to anyways. So I've prepared a couple of road signs. As you see there, I have, I have problems with road signs, especially when you go to other countries. You look at signs, you're like, the hell does that mean? So I've prepared a couple and see, can okay. you figure them out? Sounds okay? good. Okay. Sure, Matthew will get them all. Matthew, go for it. <laughs> um, okay, that's the sign saying, don't drive your car off the pier into the sea. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> you like, nailed it. <laughs> you're, near, you're near a lake or the sea yeah. or something? Well, actually, what country is it from? That's the funny thing. Oh, right, the country. Give it a guess. Banyolas. <laughs> That's not a country. <laughs> so, <laughs> suddenly, Banyolas has become a country, no? It's like you're the president. Uh, <laughs> it's actually Ireland. In Ireland, oh, really? because we're an island, I suppose they just have to stop people from driving off the end of it. You know, it's like, lads, the road ends here, huh? Easy there, easy there. Yeah. All right? Interesting. So, Interesting. the next one. Let's see what's going on. Gael Schley. Okay, that's uh, Irish. That's uh, Irish, of course. Exactly. I no idea what it means. Well, look at the sign itself. It should be able to, to give you a, a, a clue as to what it might mean. Well, of course. I mean, I know what the sign means, but I, the words uh, uh, translated into uh, English would be... Um, um, Slow down. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> slow down. Basically, slow down. Slow okay, down. Take slow it down. easy. Chill out, you know. Okay. Slow down. All right, uh, obviously from Ireland as well, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, the next one. For the oh, next this, 88 this is, kilometers, this is your... Well, I think this, this, is, is this one is easy, exactly. Very good. Uh, what animals are they? A kangaroo? Yes. Uh, a camel? A camel? Well done, yes, a camel. And a koala? Uh, a 
Um, a koala. <laughs> so, a sort of, Watch out for the koala. He's coming of, down from, I don't know, from the eucalyptus tree. Sort of big like a small koala. rabbit without ears, without mm. long ears, so small wombat. ears. It's a bloody a wombat. wombat, exactly. And you know what the funny thing is? Saudi Arabia imports camels from Australia. When no. they run out of camels, I swear to God, there's so many camels, it's like an invasive species, and they've, thir they've flourished in the center of uh, the outback in Australia, and the, uh, the, camels the Saudi flourished. Arabians actually import them. The yeah. camels flourished they in flourished Australia. They flourished in, like, in nice. That's amazing. No, you, I bet you didn't know yeah. that. No, I, like so many other things, I didn't know that either. <laughs> and the last one, my personal favorite. Okay. Beep, beep. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> this must be the United States. Of course. Roadrunner. Road runner yes, crossing. exactly. Mm -hmm. No wily coyote to catch him. And uh, did you know that they actually do run quite fast? Oh, do you know how they fast? They do? That uh, they I, run fast. Uh, uh, th yes. Thanks to some pre previous uh, <laughs> uh, things that I've looked up, they run at 32 kilometers per hour. That is fast. Yeah, yeah. like Usain Bolt. That is Bolt. fast. Can they fly? Uh, they can if they, if they reach the point where the, where the wily coyote is about to catch them or press his, his bomb, they can take off. Yes. Of course. Well, that, <laughs> this has been really interesting. I must yeah, admit fun. that I uh, enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. No See problem. you next week. And, yes. Uh, thank you, Matthew. You're welcome. Well, so much for the weekly mag of this week. You can go online to catch up with all the episodes and sections and follow us on the social networks. Don't forget to post the solution to the guesswork puzzle by Mario Serra, which is a movement constantly invoked by cinema directors, six letters. Well, have a nice week and keep your English up and running.